Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Campus Consortium's Ed Talks I seminar featuring Case Western Reserve University. Today's presentation will focus on the future of IT in education. Our presenters include Ms. Sue Workman, Chief Information Officer at Case Western Reserve University, and Mr. Mills, Senior Consultant at Campus Consortium. We will take questions at the end of today's presentation that have been typed into the chat box or questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Without further ado, please allow me to present Mr. Mills and Ms. Workman. Over to you, Mr. Mills. Good afternoon and welcome to Ed Talks, hosted by Campus Consortium. As some of you know, Ed Talks is to facilitate thought leadership in the education community. In today's session, again, it's part of our 2020 series, we've asked our guest speaker to share with us her thoughts on what will education look like in 2020 and how will information technology evolve to meet the needs of students, faculty, and administration. I would like to extend a warm welcome to today's guest speaker, Ms. Sue Workman, Vice President for University Technology and Chief Information Officer at Case Western Reserve University. We are very honored that Ms. Workman has given us the opportunity to have her speak in today's session. Ms. Workman has had more than three decades of experience and a broad range of functions within the field of information technology. In her role at Case Western Reserve University, Sue was responsible for creating the vision and the strategies which enable the delivery of technology solutions that support Case Western Reserve University's mission of teaching, learning, and research, and the day-to-day -day functions of the university. As a member of the President's Cabinet and President's Council, Workman advises university leadership to help accomplish strategic campus goals and support the mission, vision, and core values of Case Western Reserve University. Additionally, Sue serves on various ad advisory boards of Internet2, Chex, AT&T, Highland, and Dell, and has served on many EDUCAUSE com uh, committees. Sue was also instrumental on a team of Case Western Reserve University and Cleveland Clinic executives who have become the first higher ed partners with Microsoft on the HoloLens augmented reality devices. She is also leading an extraordinary change process with Case Western Reserve University's initiative to centralize all of Case Western Reserve University's IT services and community, bringing a once very distributed culture together as one unified organization. Before joining Case Western Reserve University, Workman served as Indiana University's Associate Vice President for Client Services and Support where her team received multiple awards for innovative projects. Workman had been at Indiana University since 1991 after spending a decade in technology-related positions in the private sector. Ms. Workman, we have about 100 attendees today from across the world. On behalf of our team and the attendees, thank you for taking that time to share with all of us your thoughts and insights around the future of technology and education. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the platform over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger and Annie, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, again, feel free to use the chat box to put topics in that we might want to discuss, or if you have questions, we can uh, do that. And I'm going to ask everyone to make sure that you mute your audios. Um, we're going to have a couple of videos, and that can cause some feedback, so we'd like to have you mute. So when I was asked to do this, you know, 2020 seemed like a really long time away. And then I started pre er, preparing for this presentation and realized that 2020 is really only two and a, a little over two and a half years away. And so we've really got a lot going on um, and a lot of things going on in higher education. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what's going on in higher education today. and um, the, the premier reason that we are here really is um, in order to promote teaching and learning um, research in some of our institutions. And so uh, we're going to start, though, with teaching and learning and really looking at 
some of the, the um, new places and technologies in teaching and learning in both augmented and virtual reality. So Case Western Reserve has partnered with uh, Cleveland Clinic and we are working on an augmented reality um, it, that I want to show you a little video clip now. We've been teaching human anatomy the same way for 100 years. Students get a cadaver, then they look at medical illustrations, and it's completely two-dimensional, and the human body isn't. Microsoft HoloLens is a holographic computer that you wear. It enables you to bring your digital world into your real world. At Cape Western Reserve University, we are focused on solving problems and creating new knowledge. My job is to teach, and I really think this could impact almost everything that we teach people. With HoloLens, you can see the muscles on top of the skeleton all at the same time. You can bring them in and out and exactly understand where things sit. You can take any anatomical part and show any of it. You can move it around to make it kind of translucent so you can see through the outside and that really help me understand like how cardiac anatomy works. I actually had a moment where I found the aortic valve and it was the first time that I've actually seen the aortic valve in relation to all the other anatomical structures. You know, it was a way of seeing it that you couldn't do with an actual heart. I think this will improve students' confidence in learning anatomy dramatically. By creating simulations with the HoloLens that lets them have an experience where they can fail, that will be the best way to learn because we don't allow people to fail too much in real life medicine. With HoloLens, you could imagine having a class standing around a model, almost like a tour group in a museum, where they're all interacting completely naturally. I spend a huge amount of time to make sure they become the best professionals because it's all of our jobs to make the world a better place. Working with Cape Western Reserve University to create this paradigm shift so that we can leap together with students into the future of education. We believe that HoloLens is going to enable us to do that. We talked about being able to use it to teach our history. We have an anthropology department, too, that I think will enjoy this technology. Anytime we change the way that you see things, it changes the way that you understand them. As soon as you can change the way you understand them, then they can change the way they see the world. And aren't we really here to help people change the world? Well, let me take you back for a moment. This is the classroom that was the, the kind of setup of a classroom that we would have had, you know, anywhere in the last hundred years, probably. And many of us probably still have many classrooms that look like this. Chairs in rows, facing forward. It's a way to get high productivity from your faculty. Well, what else is this for, really? I mean, come on. So, you might remember this from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but we set up our classrooms like this in order to take attendance. <laughs> we also have classrooms set up this for another reason. These are actual real signs that um, I, I found at another university that were written in classrooms that were set up in rows and rows and rows of seats, which is never move the tables. Never, never change the camera presets. And do not move the tables even a little bit. So when I saw these, it's like, what is this? You know, we were designing these classrooms with the janitors in mind. So, you know, these are notes, I, I think, written um, by the janitors so that they can easily clean the room and, and don't have to reset it every day. So that's not exactly what we want to have happen in our classrooms. And we really have a disruptive change going on. I think we've all seen this coming, but we have to be able to look at this very differently. Online education has given us this disruption, and I think that, that we're just really at the beginnings of how we deliver classes online. So, you know, we're seeing this starting to sort out a little bit. Um, you know, we see Arizona State University with um, uh, online teaching and, and reaching out in a different audience than they've had before. Um, at, at ASU, they're actually teaching online courses 
with their normal faculty. We see another model of this in Southern New Hampshire University, and they have a completely separate faculty that teach their online courses. And then even this week, we heard Purdue announce that they were buying Kaplan um, in order to really expand their online education. So what kind of disruptor is a public university buying a private corporation? I think we need to really begin to think about that and how that might that model might in fact be extended throughout um, higher education in, in different ways than maybe we've ever thought before. I, I don't believe I've ever uh, remember a university that acquired a corporation before. And so we have uh, mergers and acquisitions now entering into our organizations and might in fact really put some disruptor in place there. So that also allows us to be more of an international figure than perhaps, or even a national figure than perhaps we once were, where there were more state line um, boundaries, typically where uh, education might have been delivered, or even just city and county um, boundaries. We really have the world at our fingertips again in order to provide this education. So this is a picture of a learning, active learning classroom at Case Western Reserve. And I think we've all been looking a little bit at you know, different, different uh, designs of classrooms and, and how to make learning more creative. Um, you know, a lot of times we just put the furniture on wheels in order to be able to move furniture and, and places in order to uh, get our groupings the way we want and collaboration the way we want. I love this picture because if you look at the left, very far left, you see the instructors are just standing there observing, really. And the students are the ones that are learning and very, very active. So we've invested, I'm sure that many of you have as well, we've invested in various active learning classrooms at, at various sizes and configurations. And I think that, you know, that will continue. We'll continue to learn how to be able to use these rooms uh, and our classrooms in a very different way. Recently, Case Western Reserve wanted to look at what is the future of our 21st century learners. And so I sent a film crew out to various middle schools and high schools in the area to really see how students learn, because it's not very far until they will be here. And I think we really have to be thinking about how to change our education in order to change the way that we teach it so that these students can learn in manners that they're used to learning. So what we saw when we went out, it's probably no surprise and no surprise to you that have children that are this age, that they don't really have textbooks. They don't really have um, any kind of backpack that they have to like carry around hundreds of pounds of, of books. But what they do have, of course, are various computing devices and they use them in all kinds of classes and all kinds of, in all kinds of um, uses in the classroom out, and outside the classroom. Even it, here we see a video coming in from outside the classroom to um, this high school class. And so we really need to be prepared for the changing way that, that our current high school, middle school students are learning and be able to then help teach them in the same ways and get our faculty and our institutions ready to teach this level of students. This is a VR, um, virtual reality picture um, showing whatever these people are looking at and through their um, goggles there. But in virtual reality, you're totally encapsulated in the space. So um, you will only see what's in your goggles or what's being projected to you. Virtual reality has a place in higher education and something I think that we can continue to use. But as we move to virtual or augmented reality, we really have to look at our classrooms. You no longer need any, really, 
some seating, you know, you might need, or you might need to be very, very um, able to move that seating around so that you, so that people actually don't fall off their chairs or, or fall down, um, and then, um, and, and be able to really utilize the virtual spaces to learn. So what we're really trying to go, do is make the impossible possible. We want to put you in situations where you can experience those situations and not necessarily um, just have to read about them. So if you think of back about the way that at least I had to learn about, say, Rome and the Colosseum, is that we had to read. Um, we might see a little picture like this, a you know, two-by-two two picture, but you had to read and assemble it in your mind and imagine it and figure out how to spit it back out on a test, typically. Um, and quite honestly, it was pretty boring way to learn. And so um, what, oops, excuse me, what we've been able to do at, with the HoloLens and others have been able to do with this augmented reality device, which is really just a, a Windows 10 computing device, is to really show you and put you in the Coliseum so that you are there. You can see and experience um, where we are. And, and you don't have to take a field trip necessarily to Rome to experience this. You can do it right in your living room, or you can do it in the classroom, or you can do it wherever um, you happen to be. And so we have a very different way of learning that I think can really push down the level of learners. Because right now, we, and for many, many years, most teaching and learning has depended upon the student being able to read. And so we can actually give students content that um, before they could maybe read that content, they could start to experience it. And, and learn from it and not really have to read and imagine and then spit it back out. They can actually experience it as it is today um, without actually being there. But I think we're really like, I guess, I've been quoting this, the TRS-80 days of augmented reality. We're at the very, very beginning of this kind of um, technology. And there's so many uses for this. It, it, there's unlimited uses. but really in teaching and learning, I think it will just be able to really transform the way that our students learn. We can even take them to Mars. This is a Mars rover. This is actually an application that uh, NASA JPL created with uh, the HoloLens and Microsoft. NASA was one of the early partners with Microsoft and HoloLens, as was Case Western Reserve and Cleveland Clinic. And um, we um, actually worked with them since November of 2014 on this application that, that um, we are going to use to teach anatomy. So we are building a, a health education campus. It's an almost 500,000 square foot building that will house our schools of medicine, nursing, dentistry, all in the same place, as well as the Cleveland Clinic Learner School of Medicine. And this will help our practitioners and our doctors get to know and work, how to work with each other um, as they're going through their education, not necessarily as they get out of their education and into the hospital. So they'll be getting, getting to know that. But this, in this particular campus, we are not building any cadaver labs to teach anatomy. And so we, have, we had to find another way to teach it. You know, again, you know, there was ways that, that in the past you might read um, about it. You might dissect a human being. Um, but there's, there's issues with that. And you can dissect only once. And um, that's, you know, you're dissecting on whatever kind of uh, disease that person might have had. There's also family issues that you have to deal with with cadavers and just sensitivity to families. Um, and, you know, you don't really get to replay and, and repeat that kind of anatomy lesson. And so we decided that we were going to start teaching anatomy in 2019 with holograms. And um, in order to do that, we know those courses have to be better than what the student was experiencing 
by uh, a cadaver and and by section of cadaver. So we've been working on this and working with our partners as well as our um, our various faculty in order to to create these classes that will be um, taught and delivered to our learners. So here's another video I'm going to play for you about some of the other work we're doing um, with HoloLens at Case Western Reserve. My mind is just kind of blown. So when I tried it on, it was perfect. Microsoft HoloLens is absolutely the most amazing piece of technology. It was immediate realization that this is something exciting and we have to be a part of it. It's incredibly interactive. You can talk, you can use your hands, you can move around. It's augmented reality. It is mixed reality. And what that means is I still see you, I still see the dream and everything around me, but the digital content is inserted into the room as if it's actually there. Start your anatomy course app, click join session. You all see that you have models in front of you. All of them from the outside, there's a home, you see the walking around the room. The whole lens provides like a new way of teaching anatomy. It's really hard to understand what the anatomy of all strength tell you. So with the HoloLens, we can literally show you what's happening in the body. Instead of having X-ray, what you see is through the skin, to look at the body in ways they haven't seen it. Yeah. In the future, I can see what they're all looking at. And that's something that we think has real power. The electricity and magnetism is inherently changing. For the first time, I was able to see surface currents and charges, and I could see the field line. I didn't fully understand it until I saw them in the HoloLens. I get it now. When we actually decided to go for a senior project, like, if you saw problems, what can we do with that? It's always so annoying when you're playing music to have to stop and turn the page, so we decided we want to scroll in music so that you never have that problem again. And then we'll look at the instrument and the music is simply floating by at the speed that you're playing. I'm working with the psychology and computer science department to help patients through therapy with the Microsoft HoloLens. And the experience that we've created could help improve a lot of people's lives. What we're working on right now is a 3D rendering of campus where we can capture real-time data on energy usage. We will visualize the energy use to help drive the sustainability initiative. It's always that way. Like, you know, we will be able to like, pop out of the table and graph and everything. Like that. And just do that now. That's so cool. You know, you're no longer programming for a computer. You're programming for reality. So the reason that we are here is for student success. And so I put teaching and learning first because I think that that, that has to be our priority as to how we move our technology and how we deliver our technology for the next generation of our students. So let's move on now to supporting research with technology. So research technology, uh, you know, it's always required high-performance computing, high-performance storage systems, um, and you know, we've really pushed the limits there in many ways. And there's there's so much I think that can happen um, through our research, and I think it's just getting better and better and so much more exciting things are coming out of it. But, you know, what we're going to see, I think, are more uh, advanced robotics uh, coming out of research technology and stuff that we will have to plan for uh, IT and higher education. You know, even in the news today, we hear about robots taking people's jobs. But, you know, I think it's not just taking the jobs, I think it's creating higher level jobs. And we have to have people trained in order to take those higher level jobs. We hear of autonomous or near autonomous vehicles. And just think about how this will change the world and the jobs in the transportation industry. And there's a, there's a real trickle down impact there to how um, people will need to be trained in order to have jobs that are higher level and being able to, to fulfill those requests. Of course, we always need uh, bigger, faster um, performance network pipes, storage. Um, and I think we, all, we have invested in that in many ways. We are also looking at, 
at Ways as uh, Higher Education to share some of those resources, uh, the Exceed projects, um, various projects to, to be able to look at how do we get that performance in networking and storage to our researchers. I think cloud research computing is something that we will start to see more of um, so that we can dial up and dial down the resources needed for high performance computing. I think this could be a game changer in the way that we are able to utilize our, our funding in order to do research computing, especially at high performance computing. Um, and we're seeing some of this now. We're experimenting a little bit. But I think it will become much more commonplace just to be able to dial that up versus having to purchase um, or, or acquire somehow the, um, the high watermark for the computing power that you need. I think we'll also see changes. I mean, we, we've heard of changes happening in the federal administration um, in granting agencies that could, in fact, um, be uh, impact uh, the way that we do um, our research in grants. And so, you know, I don't know what those are yet. I don't think anybody does. Um, I don't think we know what the impact will be, but I think it's, it's probably certain that we will have to deal with this in higher education in the near future. Let's move on now to uh, supporting the enterprise with technology and enterprise computing. So enterprise computing, much of us will think about ERP systems when we talk about enterprise, but we're really talking about all kinds of things um, as far as our infrastructure. But, you know, we do have fairly old interfaces in our ERP systems, and um, there's some new ones that are coming about, but the switching costs are very, very high. And so in order to, say, move to a more modernized ERP system, you really have to be able to justify somehow the cost, um, sometimes in the hundreds of millions of dollars, to be able to switch to those systems. And so I hope that we will be able to really find uh, more modern systems that can, in fact, provide us better data, better information, better decision-making information that will come in at a lower cost. Um, you know, we just have to be able to look and see when these modern systems will actually um, the cost of these will actually outweigh what, what we have to pay for them. And really ask the vendors to do something really innovative um, for ERP in order to, to make this something that we can utilize more uh, current systems and current ways of interacting with each other. Infrastructure, when we're talking about networks, um, you know, infrastructure is core to the campus, I think, and will be for the foreseeable future. Not sure um, when we can ever get out of actually having our own infrastructure or if we ever will really want to. Uh, wireless will only will only increase the needs. So we, we have more devices, we need more bandwidth, we have more use. And so wireless and wireless technologies um, will continue to develop and and be just a requirement for everything we do. We start to look at the Internet of Things. Um, it's estimated that by 2020, there will be 2 trillion connected devices. So wireless will be really important for the uh, Internet of Things. But not only will the use increase, our vulnerabilities will also increase. So we really must um, be on the, the lookout for how um, we protect these things. Um, there, there are already, and I think will continue to be, counterfeit devices that, that do not do good things. They, they're just out there to, um, to do bad things. But we really must make sure that we have uh, smart and secure uh, connected devices and cyber physical systems that um, we can live within. And we really see this digital revolution coming. 
with the Internet of Things as well as the, the continued progress with technology. And we have to be ready for it. Um, we have analytics right now for all kinds of things. We have teaching and learning analytics. We have research analytics. We have business intelligence. So we have analytics for all we do. We really, been, I think, as a as a market in higher education, we've been kind of playing around the edges here. I don't think we've really made the impact yet that data science will allow us to do. I think it's just still in its infancy, but it has great promise. And I think as we can begin to simulate and visualize our data, we will make better decisions and teach better, learn better, and do research better. Cloud computing. Um, it's been around for a while. I think it's it's really starting to take off. A few years ago, people were debating whether or not to uh, whether or not they would allow their data to be outside of their data center. And so we really have to start thinking about you know how long will we need to keep a data center? Will we really ever turn it off? Should we ever turn it off? Um, but this also begs a couple of other questions. One is just where is our data? And yeah, we can cover that in our negotiations and contracts in some instances, but really just gathering it back up um, is, is really tough. So not long ago, my father was cleaning out the family pictures and he gave each kid their envelope full of, of family pictures. Um, I was the middle child, so I didn't have as many, but we won't go into that right now. Um, but we really had, we, we knew where they were. And so now, even, so family pictures, where are they? How can we get them? How can we gather them and pass them down to the next generation? Same thing with our data. How can we gather it? How can we get it to the right people in order to get the right, the right places? Cloud computing is also changing what we need for personnel. And we have to really make sure that we are addressing our personnel needs and changes and retraining um, as, as we move to cloud computing in general. Cloud computing also changes the way we negotiate contracts. So with X as a service, um, these contracts change as well. So we, the terms that we've used before are no longer applicable. We do have to worry about where our data is stored. We have to worry about data transit. We have to worry about um, what happens with that contract. So um, what will the vendors do? Um, when, and will they continue to raise prices? When is, when is it not as cost effective? Or when do we not get as big a service jump as we do now? I mean, right now we get some business continuity typically out of it. You get back up out of it. So there's more than just storage or, or running your service, but we have to make sure that, that we continue to get that. Uh, Internet 2, Net Plus has provided cloud um, licenses for us for a while, and I think that's been a, a good way to um, bring the scale of higher education to uh, our campuses, the scale of purchasing, the scale of negotiation, the scale of even the legal arrangements. So it's made it easier as our legal departments have been uh, educated on NetPlus and their contracts to be able to get our contacts, contracts through more quickly. Um, but also what's happening here is um, we are some, sometimes changing from um, capital expenditures to operating um, expenses, which means there's different accounting methods that have, have to happen here, and um, it really you need to be very aware of what that impact is before moving too far into the cloud or into service areas um, and how that might help you. I did get a call from a um, magazine the other day that wanted me to do an article on unclouding. It's a, a term I hadn't heard before. Um, and I did not do it because I, I have no experience yet with unclouding. But I think unclouding is something that we do have to think about is when does, when does, the, when do we cross the line, when do we cross the slope where 
providing services in a cloud is better for us than, than bringing them back in-house. And so it will be interesting to see if the pendulum does swing and when it swings back into um, doing anything on-premise. Cybersecurity. Well, unfortunately, we're at a time right now when um, we have to have really a security first mentality over services, over ease of use. We have to make sure that everything we do is secure and we're protecting our institutions in cybersecurity. So this is not only for the enterprise, but also the individual. How do we keep our faculty and students doing playful research uh, and learning in a safe environment where it is cyber secure? Um, I have debated whether to um, put this in there or not, but I hope it don't offend anyone. But you know, I'm okay with building a big wall. I just want it to be a big firewall, and. Um, I think we're all, we all need to stand up and call for cyber protection. I'm not talking about shutting down our rights or anything like that, but protecting our institutions and our personal data and privacy. Um, we've gotten too used to our data being stolen and, and maybe not even doing anything about it anymore. Um, and I think we have to really figure out how to um, look at our cybersecurity in a different way. And I just don't think that we can keep trying to do security as in individual institutions. Uh, I think that, that's noble, it's good, we have to do that. But I also would like to see us figuring out how do we develop cybersecurity that can help each other. Um, maybe we develop individual, um, or I'm sorry, a group SOC. Um, that, that really defends us. The, the individual differences of being attacked is not any, any different for one institution than the other. We do have RAN ISAC that helps us with sharing information, um, understanding what our threats are, but it would be really nice to scale up our efforts and defenses and work together in order to try to um, keep our systems and our people and our data secure. So let's move now into a little bit more about personnel and finance. So uh, preeminent staff is what we're all going to have to have, I think, as everyone wants, I think at, at all times. Um, we stated earlier that cloud computing is really going to force us to change what kind of staff we really need, what kind of talents. Um, virtualization might change the way we do desktop support. We might not need to have um, many people out there doing desktop support as being able to provide it um, centrally and being able to push that out. Uh, we have I think teamwork um, and organizational agility will continue to just be uh, increasingly important to our organizations really have to be able to, to have people that can think outside the box and be able to serve in many capacities um, as we grow and develop. Some organizations, many are centralizing. Um, Case Western Reserve has just completed a centralization of all IT personnel, servers, and now finances will be um, included in that. So there's various, middle, there's various models around right now of decentralized computing and centralized computing. Um, decentralizing was uh, uh, the model in uh, the 1990s and you know it really worked pretty well for 20, 25 years and it was, it was the way that we could actually deliver the services that we had. I'm not saying that every institution should be centralized. I think it's just a way to look at, you know, how, how do you best use your services today with the tools that we have today and to be able to keep our cybersecurity in control, um, to leverage our efficiencies and effectiveness, to, to um, use our stewardship um, 
as well as we can to make everything better for all. And really then also developing our personnel and, and providing for um, a personnel development, professional development. We typically don't have more money than we need, so we have to be very good stewards of all of our resources. Um, we've been doing more with less for many, many years now, and I don't see that going away. I think we just have to find ways in order to uh, reallocate and look at how we can um, innovate in order to use our resources the best we can. And let me talk a moment about leadership, IT leadership, and what is probably going to be needed for um, the future of IT in higher education. So we really have to be leaders. We really have to be visionaries and partners. So we're, the CIOs of the past, I think, have been um, in various shapes and forms. And there is a, a balance between strategic and technical, between operational and strategic. Um, but that that pendulum is now leaning much, much more towards being a strategic partner. So we really have, there's two kinds of leadership, two kinds of IT leadership in higher education right now. There's one kind that is leader of services, just make sure the trains are running, and then there's another one that's really being a business partner and working with the organization on business um, virtues. We have to con continue to have leadership and services and support and provide excellent customer service to our constituencies. Um, services and support sometimes are looked at kind of as the, the little sister, if you will, or, or the um, maybe the secondary um, operation in an IT organization. And really, it has to be up there primary, and we really have to to count services and support as equally as important as any of the technical services that we have. Um, we really need to push uh, our, our services closer to the user, um, provide self-help, and really, I guess, make the easy button happen for our users. In order to do all of this, it really will take resilient leadership. I think there's some hardness that's going to happen for many institutions. There's, um, you know, certainly some fiscal uh, challenges that we have. There's um, registration and and uh, challenges that we have. And in order to um, actually break through those cracks and lead, um, we're going to have to really change some of the things that we do. I continue to. To, to lead with integrity and ethics. Communication is also a big one. Um, I don't know about you all, but uh, if we could solve the communication issue, we would be rich. And so um, I think we are just bombarded every day with so much stuff that we really have to figure out how to communicate to our higher ed IT audiences in a way that they can quickly assimilate, as well as pay attention to and actually get the messages that we have to tell them. We need, it's important that we continue to be transparent. Um, we need to continue to look at the services that we provide and have traditionally provided and look at, at our costs, our true costs, our fully loaded costs, and our satisfaction of of delivering these services and making sure that we are delivering these services in the best way we can. And that may be a cost situation or it may be a service level situation, but we need to make sure that we are, are um, being very transparent with our organizations and upfront. Outcomes, measuring outcomes is, is a big one. We, we have typically measured inputs along the way, but as we start to have more data and look at those analytics. Um, hopefully, we will be measuring outcomes in a, in a better way as well. Relationship building will always be important. Um, I think it will only become more important with the consumerization, consumerization of technology 
and um, being able to get our work done. Um, certainly, we can't take the people out of it. In fact, we got to put the people, I think, back more into the center and see how, how the IT organizations can work to be true partners in, on campus. Again, we need a, a real disruptive change. Um, we have the aging of IT happening now as well. So the, um, we see many CIO retirements. We're seeing, seeing retirement of our, our high-level technical staff. Um, and how do we replace those? And do we replace them? Maybe we don't replace them. Maybe we look at what we need for the next generation and try to raise that. But I think we will see a disruptive change in the next five years of our uh, technology staffing and our technology leadership and really need to be making sure that we are prepared to handle that. So the point really is to be uncomfortable here and, and continue to, to learn. So in the early 2000s, um, technology got kind of boring there for a while. It was really just bigger processors and faster networks and bigger storage. We really weren't making the kinds of disruptive change. But now we can really make this disruptive technology work for us and continue to um, innovate into our future. Our, co our competitors are changing. And you know, I think in higher ed, we typically don't think about competing with each other. But because we do see uh, other kinds of education enter into our markets. Um, we look at private, in we look at um, for-profit institutions. And um, we do have a different competitor than what we've had before. And even the competitor of the cost of higher education. And is it worth it to, to invest in our students? I believe it is. And I think we have to actually make sure that the services we're providing show that that, that is the case. And in order to do that, technology has to be in there and be an innovator. So continuing to innovate is probably the best thing that we can do uh, for the future of, of IT and higher education, looking at ways that we teach differently, that students learn differently, and that we can do research differently, and that we can run our businesses more effectively will actually uh, be the, what we really have to do in the next few years to keep education going. So with that, uh, I thank you for listening. And if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat, chat box, and we can uh, go from there. So Roger, I'm going to uh, turn this back over to you. Oh, we'd like to thank uh, Ms. Sue Workman for taking out her valuable time for addressing attendees from all over the world with her thoughts. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank everybody from the audience to join us today. We're going to start with a question and answer round. So, um, uh, so uh, I, I have a hand raised from one of our audiences, right? And uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, have that address. So I think Jerry from the audience would like to ask, ask you a question. He's raised his hand, so I'm going to unmute his line and have him address you. One second. Jerry, if you can hear me, I've unmuted your line. You can ask a question addressed to Sue. Meanwhile, I'm taking another question from the audience. We have an, a question from Brock Zotner. Um, he, so he's asking, against your mission to be stewards of the university's assets, at what point do you move away from we've always done it this way? As soon as you possibly can. I, I, I don't think that because we've always done it this way, it, it's the, the best way to do it in the future. So I would question, um, beginning now, um, or beginning last week, I guess, when um, what the value of that is. And so we really have to, to evaluate um, what the value of doing it the way that we already have. There are some switching costs. There are, um, and, and when I say costs, it's not just about licensing or those kinds of things, but really moving into a different way of working. And so I 
I don't think that we can take anything for granted anymore, and we have to ask every every decision that we're making about how, is this the best way we could do it. Thank you, Sue. I'd like to also ask you a question. I think it's a follow-up to Brock Gottner's question. Um, <clears throat> with the ability to outsource any uh, service, how do you re, uh, you know reconcile that with the fact against your mission? Uh, uh, you know, you know. I mean, to replace universities' assets or to support them. How do you look at outsourcing? Well, I think again, you need to look at it individually with each each instance. So there are organizations that are outsourcing all of their IT now, but you know that that's a pretty um, drastic move, and I think you have to really evaluate whether or not that's the best move for your university. Um, it might be for some smaller universities because no matter what size you are, you know, from the very smallest university to the biggest, we almost all have to provide the same services and so or close to the same set of services. So, you know, there's organizations that have thousands of people to provide those services and there's organizations that have a handful. And so I think looking at each of the services needed, what is available to you, what kind of service levels you can get. Um, as long, I think that it is time for us to really take a hard look. We can't just assume that the organizations or services we have today are the best way to do it. If there's a better way to do it, then we just then I think we have to stand up and take a leadership position and move to that. Thank you, Sue. Uh, another question from the audience is that uh, technology can often be seen as a barrier to te teaching and learning. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's correct. It can be a barrier, especially if it's done really badly. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that in order to use technology, I don't think everyone needs to use technology, but I think there are ways that you can really um, increase your effective teaching and learning by utilizing technology in a very well-planned way. And so just putting a, a technology in the middle of your classroom probably isn't going to change it or make it any better. It might make it worse. And so I think you really have to, to rethink about how you designed your class and how um, students are using that technology to learn. Thank you, Phil. Uh, if you had to sum up uh, this whole session by just t telling us a little bit about, you know, how we've come a long way from what future of, you know, what, what would you have said if it was five years back in terms of future of IT and education and now compared to where we're heading uh, with, you know, augmented reality and, you know, uh, VR and let's say artificial intelligence, how do you see this moving forward uh, in IT, especially with related to IT and education? Well, I think we've got a great future ahead. I think we have the opportunities to really make a, a huge difference. Five years ago, I would not have believed we would be where we are right now um, with augmented reality. In fact, when um, I was invited to go to Microsoft in November 2014 to see the HoloLens and, and that technology, I wasn't really excited about it. I had seen virtual reality in different forms before, in, in caves or in, in other forms, and I would say it was less than thrilling to me. But the first time I saw augmented reality with uh, where you can actually see the things that are around you in context with what you are um, looking at, I came out of the first demo and said, you just changed my life. I didn't think I'd see this in my lifetime, let alone in my professional lifetime. I think we have the opportunity right now to really take the technologies that we're seeing come out and make a huge difference in, in the way that, that we do see uh, people learn and, uh, and the way that we can teach them. In one of the videos that I was showing, and if you, you got, there was a, a physics faculty that was showing the way that uh, forces act 
in a 3D in a 3D model. And so, you know, I was a pretty good physics student, but it was because I was a good math student. And so I could do the equations. I but I ne didn't necessarily <laughs> understand the forces or how it would look or could visualize that very well. So I'm kind of wanting to go back and take physics again and, and understand it in a different way than just solving math problems. And so I think we have opportunities there. I think there's opportunities in art. I think there's opportunities in um, our dance department is also very interested in how we do augmented reality and, and being able to do various performances, not even in the same room. I think there's huge uh, clinical, uh, medical clinical um, ways that we can make a difference with our students and even our patients and, and how people can visualize what what's wrong with them or how doctors can explain that to them. So I think if we look back five years, it was not really all that much fun, <laughs> I would say. But now we've got the ability to have a whole lot of fun make a whole lot of difference in many people's lives. Thank you once again, Sue. I'll be taking the last question for today. And the question is really about who's digital future. So, you know, there's, there's a little doubt that digital technology will change the character of teaching and learning in fundamental ways. But large question remains un unanswered. So should we be expecting technology to enhance educational equity or create new kinds of inequality? Or what kind of, you know, teachers and, and learners should new technologies first serve? Or um, basically, who will make the necessary investments in building education's digital future? Well, I don't know a whole lot. Because, I mean, I don't know. And if I did, I'd invest in them, um, <laughs> in, in the company. But you know, I, I think that this is a team effort now. This is not just the technology organization or a vendor that really is providing those solutions. I think it's a team effort between even the students and the faculty and IT and our vendors in order to really create the future that is a positive one for our students and faculty. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, I think, very exciting. We could do this the wrong way, and probably we will. We probably will have take some risks that don't pay off. But it, the flip side is we need to take those risks in order to learn and in order to then create and improve the technologies that we use in teaching and learning and research in, in, in the university. Right. Um, so I, I don't want to disappoint this attendee, but uh, I have a question from Christopher Thomas. He's, he's asking, with shrinking budgets and less funding for operations, what are your thoughts towards achieving the implementation of these advanced technologies? Just got to figure it out. Um, and, and I know that sounds a little flippant, but I think we've got to prioritize what um, our money is used for. There are some institutions that will um, probably make bigger gains than others. And then you know, the ones that are out front are spending more to to create those technologies than the ones that can then utilize those on the back end. So I think we have to just prioritize and regulate what what we spend and, and think about every every penny we spend. Thank you so much, Sue, uh, for taking out your valuable time to address our audience today. Well, exactly at 3 o'clock, and I quickly would like to wrap up this session. Um, I just want to talk about camp, Campus Consortium. We've been driving ed talks. We've been driving the future of IT and education. We're also liaison with a lot of uh, uh, te technology partners to bring uh, you know, cost-effective technologies to institutions who have a very, very small IT budget. So Campus Consortium largely offers grants that cover the implementation, licensing, licensing and discovery setup costs for uh, grants that are associated with Campus Consortium, such as you know, the mobile or the portal or, let's say, housing services. And I think it will be great if you want to go ahead, go to our website, see these grants, uh, apply for these grant applications. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, a quarter of uh, applications coming in uh, every, every quarter. We've been trying to do our bit to uh, the field of education. And for now, uh, I'd like to have everybody 
<clears throat> be aware that we'll be posting a recording of this uh, uh, webinar to our social media forums, and uh, you can get a presentation copy uh, on you know from us in case it's required. We'll send you a follow-up email. But uh, thank you once again for participating. You may follow us on Twitter, and if you need to watch that talks now, we have a whole lineup on our website. Thank you so much, everyone, for today. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Sue, once again.